Next, on Viewpoint, a woman shares about her battle with cancer and how she believes God gave her the power to survive. I was writing books, traveling and speaking, and I thought, are you kidding me? In an attention deficit culture, how can we get the message of Christ to stick? Being online, being on the web, all those things are contributing to this short attention span. That's coming up next. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. One of the most common prayer requests we see are families struggling with the diagnosis of cancer. We know our God is a God who can heal, yet sometimes he heals and sometimes it seems like he doesn't. People get confused. And Carol McLeod is an author, wife of a pastor, and has overcome a lot of battles with infertility, depression, and yes, even cancer. And Carol, in mm -hmm. 2014, I mean, after everything else that you've, God has taken you through, you heard this word, cancer. I mean, is this, did it initially strike fear? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was afraid. I was angry. I was in disbelief. I was gobsmacked. Um, I'm the first person in my family for generations who's ever heard the word cancer. Really? Nobody has ever gotten this diagnosis. Sick. I'd Sick. gone in for my yearly mm -hmm. mammogram and got the diagnosis of a aggressive breast cancer. Aggressive? Yes. Who were you mad at? Um, you said you were angry. I was mad at the devil. Just I was mad at, mad at why, the... Why didn't he go away after all the other right. attacks in, in yeah. your life? For, for attacking me, you know, Craig and I had, were just new empty nesters. Um, yeah, lot we of, loved lot of our life in front of you. Yeah, with right. The grandkids I was writing books, traveling, and speaking, and I thought, "Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me?" Oh, yeah. And so, where do you go from there? I mean, you, when you went into the depression, you you, mm -hmm. you and Craig sat down. And you had a battle plan. Right. Right. What did you do with cancer? Well, with cancer, I we went to the finest doctors we could find, and we did everything they told us to do, Bob. Um, I had a series of five different surgeries. One I almost died in because they couldn't stop the bleeding. Um, and you know, Bob, this is going to sound outrageous to some of our listeners, but ever since I was a little girl, I have asked the Lord to allow me to take joy to dark places. I thought I was going to go to the Amazon River. I didn't realize that he was going to say, hey, Carol, would you like to go with me to cancer hospitals? Would you like me yeah. to go with me to oncologist's office? So for the next 18 months, Bob, I had a great time taking the joy of his presence. Now it was hard yeah. and I hated it and I never want to go through it again. But I loved every minute of taking the joy of the Lord to people who are in pain. What was that fighting verse? What was the verse that just kept coming back over and over again that you knew would drive Satan away? You knew that would drive depression or fear, anxiety, uh, just drive those things away. What was, that, what was that scripture? I was three days into the diagnosis knowing I was in for the fight of my life. And I said, God, I need a scripture. I need to hear mm -hmm. from you. And so I looked where I was supposed to read that day in my quiet time, and it was in the book of Nahum. Now, Bob, most people don't even know Nahum that. is in the Bible. That's, yeah, that's it's back there. Yes, yeah. yeah. But it's an obscure little book um, nestled in the last part of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And Nahum 1.15 says, And the wicked one will never pass your way again. He is cut off completely. And so that became my fighting verse. And every time was, I was afraid, I would say, but the wicked one is never going to pass mm -hmm. my way again. He's cut off completely. So did you think that was going to be fulfilled at the end of this? this I did. This was going to be the end game? Yes, I, I felt mm -hmm. like the Lord was going to get me through cancer and I was going to be okay. You, you've also described yourself as a, as a christmas a holic. I am. Love Christmas. I, I, I appreciate that as yeah. well. This, you were going through this over Christmas. How do you retain norma, normality and, and normal family relationships and all the grandkids and the kids and the gifts that God's giving you when you're fighting a battle like mm -hmm. this? Uh, how did you get through that Christmas? Well, I laid the ground rules to my family. I said, there will be no crying. Mm -hmm. I said, we're going to gather one night. We're going to talk and pray about what I'm going through but we're gonna celebrate Jesus. We're gonna celebrate the fact that mm -hmm. he came so that I could be healed. But one of my stories, Bob, that you're gonna love is that it was the week between Christmas and New Year's and I was going to the oncologist and I didn't know it, but I was gonna get very bad news that day. 
And whenever I would go into a doctor's office, I would say, Lord, who do you want me to sit beside? And I sat beside this woman with no hair and a gray complexion. And I said, how are you doing? And she said, not very well. And I said, you're not, why not? And she looked at me like I was the stupidest like person crazy. on the face of the planet. And she said, because I'm dying. Uh -huh. And she said it just like that. And I said, you know what? None of us gets out of here alive. Yeah. We're all dying at some, it, 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 there's a stage, it's, right. it's life. Yeah. And so I just started talking to her and sharing her about the hope and the joy I had. And at the end of this two or three minute conversation, I said to her, um, Martha, can I pray for you? And then she started to weep, just weep. Mm -hmm. And she said, Carol, I have battled cancer for seven years and you are the first mm -hmm. person who's ever said, can I pray for wow. you? And Bob, I thought, Lord, where are where we? Are they? Yeah. Where are we? And so, you know, I knew that if that was the only reason the Lord took me through the battle, it was worth mm -hmm. it. It was more than worth it. So what, how do you answer that question? Why good people? People, you know, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ go through such hard times. Are you better equipped to do it? And so God uses that in the testimony? Or well, is there uh, other reasons why good people go, you know, go through hard times have, battling things like cancer, or depression, or infertili infertility? Well, I've obviously thought about it a lot, and I've mm -hmm. looked at the Word, and, and my book, Refined, addresses that in a very succinct way. But what I'd like to say is that um, there is a perfect place and it's called heaven, and we're not there yet. Right. We are on planet Earth where the enemy attacks, um, where he's, uh, Peter says that he's, he's roaming, looking for somebody mm -hmm. to devour. And so often as believers, we're caught in the crossfire. Sure. We're, we're caught in, in these things that are part of our experience on planet Earth. But Bob, the good thing is we have the Lord. Mm -hmm. We have the Lord to get us through the hard things in life. He is a friend that sticks with us. He is good all the time. His goodness is chasing us down, and we have his strength. Right. What do you say to someone who says, okay, God could have, you could have averted this cancer. Uh, did the devil give it to you? Are we in a fallen world and just happened, like you say, got caught in the crossfire? Does God ever cause things like this to bring good out of it? Yeah, I have to say no, because mm -hmm. you use the word cause. Right. Okay, so my answer to that is always this. So are you telling me that God has cancer in heaven that he decides to throw your way? No, no. that's preposterous. Okay. So change it from cause to allow. Well, I think that he's allowed us to live in a fallen world. You know, the minute we get saved, he could take us to heaven. Yeah. He could deliver us to that perfect place, but he chooses not mm -hmm. to. And the reason he chooses not to is because he is the God of all comfort and he's got a job for us to do and that's to comfort others who are going through human pain. And so as long as we live this side of, of heaven, there will be tribulation, but cheer up because he's overcome the world. And I always say to people, don't waste your pain, but use your pain as a platform for ministry Right. And, and for encouragement. That is great, great, great advice. Thanks. And what else has it done in your life? I mean, it's made you brave. Yeah. What else has it done with your lifestyle or with your choices in life? Yeah, so after I got to the other side of cancer, I was on a horrible drug. It was causing me to lose the use of my arms and legs. Oh. So I said to my oncologist, hey, I'm done. I, I got to <laughs> live. I, I've got to live whatever time I have left. And, and so he coached me. He said, okay, Carol, if you're coming off this drug, then you will eat no more sugar. Mm -hmm. You will eat no processed food. Um, you Good will, advice when you're healthy as it well. It <laughs> is. I wish I would have heard it 20 yeah. years ago. I've changed all of the products I use on my body. I don't um, put any chemicals on my body anymore, whether it's deodorant or toothpaste mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is. Um, and I'm healthy. I'm doing great. You're doing good. I'm doing great. Praise God. Yes. Yeah. That is good advice for all of us. It is. It really is. Carol, we talk about the end game or the royalties, what comes out after all of this, the suffering and the battle. And the, what, if, what if that is death? What if uh, there's someone out there right now and they've, they've, they've struggled with it? Uh, uh, they, they're either praying for a spouse or a loved one and, and God didn't heal in this way. Uh, the, the, the end game was death. Where's the royalty in that? Well, Where's the spoils in that? Well, to me, the royalty is him. 
it's his presence, mm -hmm. it's being with him. You know, I, Bob, I tell people all the time, heaven is a real place. It's yes. an actual location. It's not pretend, it's not a fairy tale. Not pie in the sky. Right. Yeah. And we're all really going there someday. And the psalmist says that our lives are like the dew on the morning grass. Oh. So whether you get 23 years or 83 years, it's still a very short time in light mm -hmm. of eternity. But now in saying that, I do not mean to diminish anyone's personal pain. You know, there are mothers whose children have gone to heaven. Yes. There are young brides whose grooms have gone to heaven. And all I can say to you is this, you did nothing to cause it. Um, the Bible says there's a time to be born mm -hmm. and a time to mm -hmm. die. The Bible says that our times are in His hands. So as believers in Jesus Christ, what we have to do is trust Him even when we don't like our circumstances. Mm -hmm. Even when we would choose a different outcome, what we have to say to ourselves, because it's found in the Bible, is that He is good all the time. Mm -hmm. And that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, death is not the end for you. It's the beginning. That's the beginning. It's the beginning. Yeah. There is someone out there right now who's, who Satan is beating them up, saying you didn't have enough faith, you didn't pray right, you did it all wrong, and you lost your spouse anyway. What do you say to that person? I would say to them, first of all, recognize who's talking yes. to you. You know, why is it so easy for us to believe the lies of the enemy, and it's so hard <laughs> for us to stand on the promises mm -hmm. of God? You know, Good so I, I, I would say to them, open your Bible, even when you don't feel like it. Extract a promise and let it comfort your soul. Let it comfort your heart because you are not alone. You are not forsaken. God is with you. Right. Would you pray for someone right now who needs to be brave? I would. would you do that? I would. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Father God, thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you that you've promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. And Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit really does give us power, that your Holy Spirit really does deliver overcoming power. So Father, for someone who's worried today, for someone who's anxious, Father, for someone who's intimidated by their circumstances, I pray that right now, in this moment, in Jesus' name, that you would fill them with your power and with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Coming up next. I was uh, at the airport just the other day and watched a young family and the parents were both glued to their phones while their kids were just wandering off. In an attention deficit culture, how can we get the message of Christ to stick? That's coming up next on Viewpoint. According to research, if you don't like what I'm about to say in the next six seconds, you'll change the channel, you'll Google something else, because our attention span due to the internet and social media has just disappeared. Phil Cook is with us today. He's a filmmaker, media consultant, and author of the book, The Way Back, How Christians Blew Our Credibility and How We Get It Back. Uh, Phil, you only have about five seconds to make a really good impression, <laughs> or we're going to change the channel. <laughs> That's it. It's true, and it's more serious problem than we really think. Uh, and, and everybody knows that if you're if you're watching this program, you know that it's harder than ever to get through that book you used to read. You know, normally it's harder than ever to get through long passages of the Bible, for instance. Uh, and we're just shrinking our attention span, and a lot of it has to do with being online, being on the web, having iPhones, social media. All those things are contributing to this short attention span, and it's real. I mean, it's real. A big part of the problem is we're simply being overwhelmed at the amount of media choices out there. You know, they, they, they say every minute, 60 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. Uh, we, we're being bombarded. The average person today is being bombarded with about 5,000 media messages every single day. So in that world, we're being pulled in so many directions, mm -hmm. so distracted that psychologists and, and, and neuro neurologists have discovered that it's actually changing the structure of our brain. So it's having more profound wow. effects than we think. Is, is this really just a, a, an issue with teenagers and young children? Or is, it, is it an issue throughout our, throughout our culture? It's an issue throughout our culture. Um, I, I, a study came out about a year ago that indicated that when you meet someone for the first time, mm -hmm. you decide what you think of that person within the first four to eight seconds. 
Now think about it. You haven't had time to meet that person, get to know them, hear what they have to say, but we're being pulled in so many directions and so distracted that we've just adjusted our behavior so that uh, we, we're making decisions now before we even have the information we need to make them. So that's just the culture we live in. Now what's interesting about that is I, I teach and, and work with pastors and ministry leaders all over the world. And I tell them, in that eight-second world that we live in today, I'm glad your sermon is anointed. I'm glad your worship is fantastic. But in an eight-second world, who's the first person a new visitor meets when they walk in the door? Because they're starting to make decisions right mm -hmm. then. What does your lobby look like? All those decisions are being made long before they ever get to the pew. So we kind of, as sad as it is and frustrating as, as it is, we have to start thinking about living in this eight-second world because it has huge ramifications. Is, and that's not, you, you don't believe that's about to change. We're not going to change that eight second world. Is no, it going, is it going to shrink more? No, I, well, it could, it could shrink. <laughs> I don't think it's going to change. I just think that we need to adjust. And there are things we can do, you know, go on a media fast. There are times that I'll put away my iPhone for a day or two just to, re just to filter that stuff out and go back to reading a normal book. Um, there's things we can do, but truthfully, most people are not going to do it. Most people are just caught up in this digital world, and they're going to go with the stream. You get all jittery when you do that? I mean, oh, you, you, you know start, what? You, you kind of do. You get the shakes at the beginning. You have to get over it. I'll tell you, I, I, I write books for a living, and I've discovered that as I write on my computer, I have to turn off the social media. I can't have Facebook or Twitter or all these other things because they're calling my name constantly. And you just have to have the screen isolated. In fact, it's interesting. There's a lot of writing programs out there that specialize in turning your whole screen black, except for the page you're working on, just to lower that distraction because it's so significant today. Is it because we think we're going to miss something? I mean, we, we, see, we see teenagers, a lot of people, a lot of families. They're all on their iPhone. There's five or six of them sitting in the lobby someplace. They're all on an iPhone. They're looking, are they afraid they're going to miss something? They're, going to, they're not going to be knowledgeable about something that's going on in the world? Or they're going to miss their friends? Is there fear involved it, in this? It is. Uh, the fear of missing out is huge. Uh, we call it FOMO out there, the fear of missing out. But keep in mind, when you're looking at Instagram all day and you're seeing pictures of other people, you start comparing yourself to other people. So we're finding that the more time kids spend on social media, the more uh, frustration they have in their life, the more disappointed they are in their themselves, their self-awareness, their, their self-image goes down because it's just impossible to compare yourself with all these great looking people that you're constantly comparing yourself to on social media. So we're actually started, starting to see real world impact in the lives of young people who are spending so much time on social media. Because you said it, it, research shows that it's actually changed the way our brain's wired in yeah. a lot of cases because of where our eyes look and how, if you watch a child playing a, a video game, you look at his eyes and they're just moving 90 miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the hope at that point? Are we, we changing who we are? Is, is, well, a couple years humans? ago, a man named Nicholas Carr came out with a fascinating book called The Shallows where he unveiled research that indicates that, you know, neuroscientists have always thought our brain was fairly fixed. We, we could learn new things, but the structure didn't change. But now we're understanding the, the, the brain has a lot more plasticity, which means it can adjust structurally, which means our attention span is shrinking, our ability, even the ability to hold a thought for very long and reflect on it is we're starting to lose that. So there's no question that it has real ramifications and researchers are uncovering some really dark stuff. Now, that doesn't mean we turn off Facebook entirely. It doesn't mean we throw away our iPhone. I mean, I think this is a, a world we have to get used to, but I think as parents, we need to do a better job of training our kids how to properly use an iPhone, how to be on social media, how to deal with it, mm -hmm. how, to, how to deal with those emotions and feelings they see when they're comparing themselves to other people. Uh, also, one thing I'd throw in just at the last minute is the porn problem. Pornography mm -hmm. is huge on social media. Uh, when you look at Twitter and a lot of other platforms, it's just rampant. And so I think as parents, we have to be really, really responsible about uh, monitoring what our kids do and uh, being very, very careful about what they're exposed to. I think now the age is down to like, uh, it was at 14, then it was 11, then most recently at nine. The first encounter a kid has today with pornography is that age is getting younger and younger simply because of the access they have to the online world. We're talking about trying to discipline our kids. Are, are we talking about about the parents being disciplined. I mean, the, well, the, the kids are going to watch what the parents are doing. If you've got a, a dad sitting there going like this and the mom's on the phone and, and watching social media, 
uh, how, do, how does an adult take control of that in their own life? I was uh, at the airport just the other day and watched a young family, and the parents were both glued to their phones mm -hmm. while their kids were just wandering off. I mean, just wandering off, getting into trouble, driving other people crazy. Parents were oblivious because they were just glued to their iPhone. Sure. So parents have a role in this, and we need to be more responsible. It, it really saddens me at restaurants when I see a family sitting around oh, yeah. a table, and the kids are alone because the parents are both on their phone. Um, we just have to be much more face-to-face, -face, take an active role in our families' lives. That's going to help the most. Where, where do parents turn to get that kind of, that kind of teaching anymore? I mean, it's, it's not something that, I don't know whether most pa pastors even feel called to address this from the pulpit about the whole attention span thing and about, yeah. the, about being immersed in social media. Uh, you think there's any hope there? Does the church really, do, does the know, church really that's, have that's a... That's a that's a great question. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's yeah. such an important question. I literally travel around the world teaching at pastors' conferences on how to use media more effectively, and this is a sure. big part of it because I want to train pastors how to teach their congregation how to deal with it. I was in Dubai. I was in Moscow just a few months ago. I'm going to Portugal this fall. I'm going to Manila and the Philippines just to teach groups of pastors how to understand the media, how to use it more effectively. And so I think a key, if there's a pastor listening to this, I, I think it is up to us. I mean, they didn't teach you this in seminary. I'm sorry about that. But you do have a role in training parents in your congregation to, to understand how to use this effectively and responsibly. And by the way, social media is a great tool for sharing your faith. Mm -hmm. Talk about responsible. You can use, I've seen many people led to Christ. Uh, others have found a church. Others have helped restore their marriage just through relationships they developed in social media. So it's not all dark. There's some very positive things happening out there, and we, in Christian, we as Christians should embrace it. Is, is that the di dichotomy that we're in, though, is we're, we're teaching pastors how to use social media to get the gospel out, and at the same time we're telling people they need to kind of get themselves away from part of that to keep themselves yeah. wired properly? Yeah, you know, life is complex. It's yeah. not an e either or thing. There's uh, mm -hmm. responsibilities on both sides. It's a lot like driving a car. People get killed in a car all the time, and yet we, we're never going to give up cars. Mm -hmm. And so I think that just being responsible in the way we do it is a key thing. And uh, Because like you say, it's never going to go away, but I'd like to take it and use it in, to extend the kingdom rather than just see people get so caught up in this that they lose their sense of self, their significance, and eventually their soul. Yeah. So uh, I'm all for trying to change and turn that tide. Yeah. We changed that. Does digital, uh, di digital church replace brick and mortar, you think, at, at some point in time? No, I, I certainly hope not. I, I think there's a place for face-to-face -face fellowship. I'm a big believer in live streaming. Uh, a lot of the churches that we, uh, our company Cook Pictures works with, uh, we help churches get on the, their their services on the web, get it live streaming because there's a lot of transient people that come to your church and maybe move to another city and would love to check in online. When my wife and I travel, if it's a weekend, we always fire up our computer on Sunday to see our church back home in LA and, and watch the service there. So there's a lot of good reasons for live streaming. However, they should never take the place, I think, for actual face-to-face -face fellowship in the context of the church. It's, church is so much more than sitting in a pew and just watching a guy preach or watching people sing. Mm -hmm. It's you being engaged and plugged into the people around you yeah. and serving those people. So I, I hope that it never goes away. I don't think it will because I think human contact will always be important. Yeah, yeah that, that is important. That's one of the things that we see uh, being stolen from our lives with all the all the, the things we have in front of us, iPhones and iPads and iPods. So true. We, we, we lose that personal uh, uh, contact. You got any quick tips for us as far as maybe weaning ourselves off of some of the time that we spend on social media? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? You know what? A couple Fasting. things. Yeah. Don't feel obligated to respond every time your phone rings. You know, sometimes if I don't know, if I see a number and I don't know who it is, I won't respond. Mm -hmm. Let it go to voicemail. You could check it later, particularly if you're at dinner, if you're with your family, or, or if you're with a friend. Another thing I would say is when you sit down to lunch with someone, don't put the phone on the table. Yeah. Leave it in your pocket. Leave mm -hmm. it in your purse. Just putting the phone, I'll tell you, research indicates that just setting your phone on the table helps you be more disconnected from the person you're talking to. There's something distracting about just having it there. Whether it rings or not, it's still distracting. So we have to be more responsible about just putting it away. It's hard, I know, 
<laughs> but uh, I carry a book with me everywhere I go or a magazine that I can read. Take those times sitting at the doctor's office or waiting at the checkout line to pull out a magazine or a book and explore that rather than always just automatically checking your Facebook page or checking your Twitter feed. It, you'll discover that your life will expand and y your brain's going to grow grow again <laughs> and you're going to have relationships with people again, which will be incredible. Today you may have heard some viewpoints different than you've ever heard from your friends, family, or even the church. Well, the point of our program is to have our guests explain their opinions based on their experiences and their faith. One thing we want to be clear about is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible says that people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, we hope this program gives you a bit more insight into what the Bible says and that it's relevant for your life today. If you want to know more or watch other interviews on demand, go to our webpage or our Facebook page. I'm Bob Placey. Join me on the next Viewpoint.